Great. Hey, I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, this is Russ Koff. I'm here to uh, interview Rich McAdock for the STR Meet the Scholar session today. Um, so I, I, I am going to do a, a kind of a relatively brief introduction of Rich because I'm a fan of short introductions and I don't want to embarrass him too much. Well, maybe a little bit. Um, so Rich, this is unusual because Rich actually asked that I be the interview and it's the interviewer for him. And um, I, uh, it's my job really to make him regret that, I think, mostly. <laughs> um, so so um, I'll, I'll start by saying, uh, you know, Rich asked me because uh, uh, we were colleagues for about 10 years at, at Emory. Uh, we met about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we've both been through many transitions since that point. Um, some of you may be familiar with some of Rich's transitions. Um, I am, um, uh, I, I, I lack some of the best pictures that I could have conceivably had of, of Rich's transitions. So uh, <laughs> you're gonna have to sort of live with, uh, you know, kind of what, what I might have. Um, but I'll let you know that, that when Rich and I met, um, this was uh, Rich oh, 1.0, I guess we'll, we'll refer to it as. Oh my goodness. Um, and, and in fairness, I really should probably admit that, um, that Russ 1.0 kind of looked like this. So um, maybe Russ was goofier than Rich uh, back then. Um, but you know, we've all gone through our periods. Uh, so here we are today. Um, and um, uh, I'm delighted that, that you all have, have come and uh, I'm looking forward to a, an interesting discussion. I'm going to structure it a little bit differently. Um, I'm gonna, I will of course introduce Rich. We will then um, talk a little bit about his research. I'm gonna start with his research and then we're going to get into the, well, how did he get there uh, question. So some, some of the other sessions have started with the, how did you get there? But I kind of feel like our research defines us in many ways. And so understanding that might help us understand uh, the journey to get to that point. So uh, introducing Rich, um, Rich holds the Brock Family Chair in Strategic Management at the Cranert School of Business at Purdue. Um, and uh, Rich has, like many of us, uh, engaged in some travels through his careers. This is uh, not his uh, first dance. Uh, he got his PhD at Wharton, uh, but uh, and since then he was at Tulane University and at Emory University, where where I met him. Um, and uh, I'm going to refrain from asking him to to comment on some of his earlier experiences because I remember what he told me about some of his earlier experiences, and I don't want <laughs> I don't want to put us in that in that role, but. Uh, Needless to say, he's been around the block. Um, his research um, focuses on competitive advantage, uh, in particular, applying economic models, uh, exploring the theory of, of economic profits, where do they come from? Um, and and uh, the economic models allow you to uh, explicate some of the assumptions that, that in many cases we take for granted uh, what the implications are of the assumptions that we adopt. Um, he's published over 19 refereed articles, over 6,000 uh, 6, sites, uh, 3,500 sites on one paper. So we'll, uh, I've already alerted him that we're going to have to talk about that paper. Um, he's got numerous uh, research awards, the AMR Best Paper Award, uh, SDR, a couple of awards from, from them, Caldwell Award from Emory, which uh, I didn't know about. So uh, maybe you'll say something about that. Um, Teaching, I only have one bullet point, but I think the bullet point says a lot. Uh, at, at Cranert, he's gotten three teaching awards. At Emory, it was 10 teaching awards. At Tulane, two teaching awards. Um, it's really impressive, and I don't know how he does it, but you know, you all may find out soon. Well, I have some hints about how he does it, and that's why I know I can't do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, in, in terms of service, uh, he's uh, embarked upon a, uh, an AE role at AMR. Congratulations, Rich. 
Uh, he's been the co-editor of multiple special issues uh, and has served on multiple boards. Um, for, the, um, for SDR, he's been involved in the, the executive committee, um, the research committee, uh, doctoral consortia, and I'm, I know I'm not getting everything there. Uh, just to be clear, I had, I, I'm sensitive to font size. So I didn't want to uh, include so much detail that the font would be um, un unreadable. So uh, I, have, I have skimmed over some things here. Um, but I will not skim over the uh, Atlanta Competitive Advantage Conference where Rich was the founder and he dragged me kicking and screaming into it. The conference had a 12 year run and uh, yes, indeed, that is the ACAC logo that you are seeing in the bottom oh, right of, yes. of the slide. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, ACAC days as well. Um, so uh, Rich, have I, have I missed anything important? Goodness, no, my goodness. Well, thank you so much for the kind, very kind introduction. It's an honor and a privilege to have this opportunity to talk with everybody today. That, that may be the last time that I'm kind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I said that I would start um, with uh, your research focus. And um, I, do, I do want to uh, talk about maybe a couple of your papers and, and uh, where they fit broadly. Um, just to give people a sense of, of where you're coming from. And of course, we'll talk about where you're going if, if you have any idea where you're going. Um, yeah, I figured you'd say that. Uh, so let's, let's start with this paper that has 3,500 sites on it. The 2001 paper toward a synthesis of the resource-based and dynamic capability views of rent creation. So um, elevator pitch, how would you describe the, the contribution? Yeah, so um, this is kind of the classic uh, Macadoc paper where, you know, you take two existing uh, causal mechanisms and slam them together and see if they have an interaction effect, basically. Uh, so the, the genesis of this was uh, my longstanding obsession with the um, the uh, the dialogue between Jay Barney's 1986 uh, management science paper and uh, Dierks and Cool's uh, 1989 uh, response to that, and then Jay's response to their response, and et cetera, et cetera. In fact, at the top of page 365 of Barney 86, um, that quote, what does it say? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember exactly. But you, you did spend a lot of time. With I that did paper. spend a lot of time obsessing over these papers. Right. And so they, they, they present different views about where, um, where competitive advantage comes from. Uh, the, the Barney view being more of a resource acquisition perspective, kind of more market oriented. Uh, and the Dierks and Cool uh, being more uh, organizational oriented, being more internally oriented, looking at uh, what I, you know, what I called capability building, right? So it's, so this paper basically takes these two um, mechanisms that the literature suggests um, could be the genesis of competitive advantage. You know, I, I label, you know, Jay's mechanism resource picking uh, superior ability to uh, pick resources that are undervalued in the uh, in the factor markets, uh, versus you know the Dirksen Cool perspective on what I called capability building, um, and I put them both in the same model uh, to see if there was any interaction effect, and lo and behold, there was, and it was a positive interaction effect as long as the um, under most conditions it was a positive interaction effect. Uh, so they, they tend to support and reinforce each other rather than, you know, undermining and uh, um, um, dampening each other. So um, but the question was, are they complements or substitutes? Right. Are they complements or substitutes? Or, or when are they complements versus <clears throat> Right. Now, there's one other aspect of this uh, that uh, I'm, I'm kind of proud of. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen for a moment. Remind me to stop sharing screens. Wait, is he allowed to do that? <laughs> we'll make an exception. I'm taking control, right? So this is, these are a few slides that I used as a discussant at AOM this past year. Um, 
on, in a, a session on formal modeling in the resource-based view. Um, and uh, this is actually, you know, the, 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 it was kind of given, I was trying to give like a historical view of formal modeling in, in the, in the resource-based view. And this is actually a, a graphic that I downloaded um, from the internet, uh, which was supposed to illustrate uh, the, the process of procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm borrowing it for a different purpose, right? To understand kind of a little bit about, you know, how we got over the hump of, of starting to use um, formal theory in resource-based and, and more generally in strategy research. So, you know, uh, probably the first, um, the first piece of formal theory in the strategy kind of research canon wasn't actually published in a strategy journal. Uh, it was published in an economics journal. Uh, it was the classic Lippmann and Rumelt 1982. Uh, that's how old it was, 1982, Bell Journal of Economics. The journal isn't even called that anymore. Uh, you know, who knows? Like, I think, you know, Alexander Graham Bell is probably turning over in his grave with the things that his names are attached to, his name is attached to. But um, this was... Um, this was an economics paper that the strategy field kind of adopted as one of its own, kind of um, uh, adopted into the strategy canon. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a very well-cited paper, very well-known paper, um, and it gets at this issue of, of, of uncertain immutability and how that can be a, a, a mechanism uh, for sustaining competitive advantage, what, what Rumelt elsewhere talks about as an isolating mechanism. Right. Rich, you know we're supposed to be talking about your work, right? I know, I know. I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that, right? Um, so that, but that was that was 38 years ago, right? And then, uh, you know, the, in between, then the, the, I'd say the next piece of formal theory in the strategy field was a paper published by Pankaj Gemawat in I think around 1991, 1992 in SMJ, which is an excellent paper, um, but nobody cites it. Uh, and so, I mean, it gets cited maybe five times a year or something like that, mostly by me, I think. Uh, and, uh, but, but in terms of, you know, opening the door for, uh, for formal theory and strategy, I think it really was the paper that you're asking about that, that did that, um, you know, this, this, this paper. Um, and, you know, since then, this idea of applying formal theory to, to the resource-based view and to other facets of strategy, um, you know, has really taken off quite a bit. And, you know, I would kind of put uh, this paper by Brandenberger and Stewart at right at the hump, you know, and I think, uh, you know, cause that's kind of been a, a very foundational paper that a lot of people have built on. Uh, and now we're kind of on the, on the, on the, the downslope, you know, of, uh, of, of moving forward. Anyway, so you're right, I, I should shut up and... Uh, and uh, <laughs> no, I, I wanna focus on your process. In fact, yeah. let, let, me, let me ask you about the process of this paper, oh, exploring the, the complements and substitutes. And I'm gonna use what I know, um, you know, later on as I saw you working on papers. Um, I think people have a, an expectation that when you're developing formal theory that, um, You've got in, in your in your terms, or maybe it's Joe Mahoney. You have to put the rabbit in the hat before you can pull the rabbit out of the hat. And, right. and the implication of that is that you actually know what the result is going to be because you have set the assumptions for the model, and therefore that's going to determine the output of the model. That's going to determine the conclusions that you can draw, and therefore somehow you actually know what you're going to come up with because of the assumptions that you've made. I wish now, I would you comment on that, please? <laughs> you know, I, I wish that were true. Uh, you know, I, I go into these- What's the discovery I, I, process like? I don't have that kind of foresight to be able to know, you know? I just, I think I try to, you know, um, throw in stuff and see how it messes the other stuff up. You know, uh, that's, that's kind of my, my, so you're saying that you have bounded rationality and you can't yeah, understand I your own models. I definitely. <laughs> um, <On some> level. <laughs> uh, did this thing? Hold on a second. I, I 
some reason it thought I wanted to share screens. No, I don't want to share screens. So um, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. I just kind of got the, I just kind of get the idea of, of combining certain things and, and put them together. And then I kind of try to see what, what makes them so, interact. So this paper, did you have ideas uh, ex ante for what, when would they be complements and when would yeah. they be substitutes? Did you I have really, a sense of what you were going to find? No, I really didn't. And I, I'll say that's true for almost all. Maybe I should by now. Maybe at this point, I should be able to kind of predict what's going to happen in these models. But, uh, uh, and maybe that's, a, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, Hal Varian published this, uh, this book chapter called uh, How to uh, what's it called? How to how to create a uh, an economic model in your spare time, or something like that. And uh, you know, he suggests starting very very simple. You know, the simplest version, and then simplify it further. I have a hard time doing that. That is what I should be doing. I start with something way too complicated, and then I have to trim things out of it to make it work, to make it solve. Um, and I think that may be part of the reason why it's difficult for me to forecast what's going to happen in my models is because I put too much into it at the, at the, at the outset. Um, so that's just, that's just a bad habit of mine. Um, but I guess but I it, it seems like even, even a simple set of assumptions gets complex surprisingly quickly. It does. It does. And, and in this case, <clears throat> you know, it, it actually came together fairly quickly. Once I had the idea for this paper, this is, this is a once in a career kind of thing. From the time I had the idea for the paper until the time I submitted it to SMJ was two weeks. That was it. it oh my me, God. Yeah, I know. I can't, I can't believe it's like the once in a lifetime kind of thing. It took me two weeks from the day I had the idea till the day it was submitted. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Looking and at the then, chat and people are like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> And then it, it breezed through the review process. I think it had one one R and R, uh, which was pretty light, and then just kind of got accepted. Uh, and it was just just an incredible blessing that 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 process that it, it went so smoothly. It's like the one time in my career, publishing a paper just went incredibly smoothly. The rest I, of I've them never had something not go three rounds. I know, I know. <laughs> That's the only one of mine that I think I could say hasn't gone three at least three rounds. So um, oftentimes, or sometimes, um, the, the paper that we are, you know, each paper is like a child, and we'll talk about your children soon. Um, but, but uh, you know, each, each paper is, is a child, and, and it's not necessarily true that the one that gets the most recognition in the world is the <laughs> one you're the most proud of. So um, is there another paper that you would uh, highlight as you know wow that I am just so proud of this it it may not have had 3,500 sites on it mm. but mm, this was incredible well let me just I, I, there's different papers I like for different reasons so let me talk about a few I think oh I, it's really hard to show favor for one I of know. your children isn't it I, know. <laughs> I think I will start I'll start with the one that you and I wrote for AMR which got that uh, two awards uh, I, I really like that paper I don't know about you, but I think <clears throat> I think that paper is 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 was ahead of its time. Uh, and I I think the pro you know I I was so optimistic about that paper and, and the impact it might have. I remember telling you I think this is going to be a thousand citation paper. <laughs> it's, I checked this morning; it was at uh, two hundred on Google Scholar and seventy seven on Web of Science. And uh, you know I think. Uh, maybe this is retrospective rationalization. I think that paper is ahead of its time, you know, in the sense that um, uh, organization theory right, really hasn't caught on to the, the benefits of formal modeling. Uh, and, uh, you know, when eventually org theory catches on to the benefits of formal modeling, people may look back on that paper as being kind of a, a pioneering paper. Um, but, uh, but it's not the field of, 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 you know, org theory isn't there yet in terms of uh, latching onto formal modeling. Um, an, another paper I particularly like is the, the 2010 management science paper. And I like that because it was my first opportunity to put into print uh, what I call the four theories of profit um, framework. Ah, yes, you spent a lot of time with those four theories. Yeah, exactly. It's been it's it's been 
you know, something that's been on my mind, you know, for the last uh, 17 years or something like that. Um, and uh, it's kind of, it's kind of the way I organize as a theorist, the way I organize uh, the field into those four theories. Um, it's influenced how I, how I teach, you know, my doctoral students and, uh, uh, and it just really influences everything about the way I read papers. Um, cause I'm always just kind of categorizing them into kind of which of the four theories they fit into. Um, and then I also, um, I like the, you know, this is not a, uh, a research paper, but the, the introductory essay that uh, Jay and Rich Burton and I wrote for the 2018 spe SMJ special issue um, seems to be getting, seems to be having a very positive influence on people. Uh, a lot of people tell me that they benefit from, from, from the framework that's in there in terms of helping them, you know, junior scholars in terms of helping them figure out how to make a, a contribution to theory. Um, and then I think the last one I'll mention is, <clears throat> excuse me, is a paper that's not in print yet. Um, it's uh, just got conditionally accepted at AMR. It's a paper with my, uh, thank you, thank you, with my, with my former doctoral student Kubalai Zhirik uh, called um, First Mover Advantage versus First Mover, First Mover Advantages versus First Mover Benefits. What's the difference and why does it matter? Um, and uh, I, um, you know, that, that paper is, we still have a few little tweaks to meet the conditional acceptance, uh, but I hope that that will be forthcoming soon. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks to Joe Mahoney for accepting the paper. Uh, and I, I like that paper because it looks, so the, the old saying was, you know, research is looking at what everybody else has looked at and seeing what no one else has seen. And that paper, I think, is an example of that. It looks at a topic that everybody has looked at. I mean, really, uh, the, the literature on, on entry order and first mover advantage, I see Gwen, Gwen smiling at this, is something, because she's, she's contributed to that literature as well, is something that everybody has looked at. Um, but this, this theory paper, I think, really kind of blows the doors off that literature, kind of drives a, a truck right through it. And, uh, um, says every, you, you all have been thinking about this wrong, and uh, so I think uh, uh, I think that one really has the potential to um, to change the way people think in a whole literature. Anyway, so those are those are the ones that I, that I like the most. So um, you brought up this uh, process issue of of uh, you know a real contribution is when you you look at what everybody else is looking at and you see something different. And I, I couldn't agree more. Usually my answer or, or my focus with doctoral students is um, what is your experience before you are coming to academia that you are leveraging because that's what's unique about you that right. you see the literature differently because you have a different sort of perspective on life from your past experiences. Um, what allows you to see something different? Um. Well, I guess I'm a. Uh, Are you just weird? I am just weird. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm, I'm kind of an abstract thinker by nature. You know, I'm much more. It's it's weird. I'm much more comfortable in the world of <clears throat> abstract ideas and concepts than I am in the world of phenomena and. Uh, and reality, uh, you know? So I think, uh, I think my gift is to be able to look at, uh, look at the things that people have looked at, at a in a more abstract way, in a more generalized way. Um, and so uh, I think that's, I think that's helped me um, in some sense, but of course it's always, every, every, every benefit is also a limitation, you know, so. I think there's 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 research that I couldn't do that I'm glad other people are doing because uh, because they have that ability to connect with the with the phenomenon that that I don't really have and uh, so anyway so yes uh, I am weird yes <laughs> <laughs> you you just just to go back to the the process a little bit um, and and I learned a tremendous lot working with you on that paper earlier. 
Um, <clears throat> and and I'm, honestly, I'm, say, I'm glad it didn't. I'm glad it didn't destroy our friendship completely. Uh, it, it almost. I know did. you were. I remember <laughs> you were worried about that. Um, <laughs> but but um, I, I'll tell you that what surprised me so much about the process, because honestly, I came to the, the process expecting that, uh, you know, you put the rabbit in the hat and you have a pretty good idea of what you're gonna pull out of the hat. And every day I would talk to you and you would say, I have a result. And then the next the next day it would be, ah, oh, it was it was a mistake. That's not yeah. really the result. And it, and and the 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 output the the insight actually would change from day to day as you as you looked at it, um, and uh, that that was a big surprise. And it, and I wanted to make sure people understood how uh, a simple set of assumptions gets so complex that actually you don't see how they interact. The intuition of how they interact is something that you have to kind of yeah. And that's out. that's the thing. I think you're right. That 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 is that is actually where I need to work more is figuring out the more, being able to more easily figure out the economic intuition behind the math, you know? Uh, Cause that's, that's where the impact is for the reader is what's the economic intuition behind the math. Um, and I've gotten pretty good at, at, you know, churning out the math and then getting this result and thinking, well, what does this mean? Why is this happening? Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a different skill. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I need to get a little bit better at that. It's it's more challenging than than uh, I would have anticipated. I guess that's what I would say. Um, so we you, you gave us this spectacular example of uh, your first submission, getting uh, writing the paper in two weeks and and then uh, submitting it and then then having it uh, get conditionally accepted. Yeah. Um, but but I know that um, like many of us, you have struggled as well. Yes. Um, is, is there a spectacular failure that you would be willing to talk about? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, 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 my, my, so, okay, so let me say, I've been incredibly blessed. In my entire career, I don't know how many papers I've submitted to, to top tier journals, but I've only received outright rejections uh, three times uh, on all those papers. Um, and on two of those, the papers have eventually gotten into, uh, uh, into print at some other top tier journal. The one that didn't make it into any top tier journal was my, was my big heartache. Um, so I, uh, I, wrote, um, uh, I wrote this paper on you know, using my data on the money market mutual fund industry. Um, and it was this paper on strategic pricing. Uh, the idea was that, um, you know, a, 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 when, a, when a new product is being introduced or especially a new category is being introduced, um, companies will, will underprice the product for a while in order to build up some, uh, some demand for it. Uh, and then later, you know, raise the prices. Um, and, so I had this paper uh, that looked at that in the, uh, in the mutual fund industry, because fortunately I actually, because of the way mutual fund accounting works, um, you, you can actually directly measure how much a, a mutual fund expense ratio is being underpriced compared to what the actual cost is. Um, and so uh, I, I had this paper where I, I, this was actually the first paper I wrote that had a kind of a little formal model in it. So it had a little formal model of strategic pricing and that generated my hypotheses. And then I used the money market fund data to test those hypotheses. Um, this paper is what got me my job at Emory because um, uh, Tom Thomas uh, was a reviewer on this paper uh, and um, he was, uh, he was, so, he, he, they were doing a, a, a search, uh, a search for some junior faculty. And uh, I think they had three positions that year. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, I, I just reviewed this paper and I, I like this paper a lot. And I, 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 I wish we could get this person to, you know, to apply for the job. 
Uh, and so he went to Ed Zajac, who was the uh, program chair uh, for the STR division that year. Back then it was the BPS division and said, Ed, I know it violates, you know, blind review, but you got to tell me who wrote this paper because I want to offer them a job. It's not, I'm not trying to do this for any nefarious reason or to or hurt the person anyway. I want to, I want to offer them a job. And Ed said, no, I, I cannot tell you who this person is. Uh, Ed, his credit was a, a you know a stickler for the uh, for the sanctity of the blind review process. Well, Tom went and found out for, through some other back channel methods. I don't know exactly how he found out, but he found me and invited me to apply for the job at Emory. This paper uh, actually then um, uh, won, it actually won the Gluck, Be Gluck Best Paper Award uh, for the Academy that year. It was uh, the 1997. Uh, Academy in Boston. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so this, this was a, I thought this was a great paper, right? Got me a job, won this best paper award. I was, you know, excited about it because I was doing a little formal modeling in it. This paper went through uh, four rounds of review over five years at SMJ before being rejected. And uh, and I got to say, it was, it was, it was right. You know, there was a, it was the right decision. It just, it did not, the results, unfortunately, uh, as excited as I was about the paper, as much recognition as the paper had gotten, the results simply did not withstand uh, the robustness checks uh, that the reviewers were, were insisting on. So um, that is, that was my heartache is that I poured you know, four year, four, five years of effort into this paper over four rounds of review and it got rejected. And, you know, it showed me that the paper wasn't, didn't have results that were. So, so I mean, to, to paraphrase uh, Lekka in the, in the chat. So your most spectacular failure got you a job and a Gluck award. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blessed. I have good failures. <laughs> Boy, that just really sucks. That's, that's <laughs> I really feel for you there. Um, but uh, well, it was a heartache. I mean, you can imagine to go through to go through you know all that effort and have it not be published. It was uh, it definitely was. In fact, I was so depressed at that point uh, that I really I was. It was the one point where I was most seriously considering quitting academia and going and becoming a truck driver or something. Uh, you know, because I would have like, been a good uh, truck driver. I would have, you know, I like I like seeing the highways. I really do. I enjoy traveling <laughs> around. And cars. I probably would have killed people on the on the highway, but you know, with, with my my lack of coordination. But uh, um, but really, I was I was so I was so depressed at that point that I was seriously considering you know um, quitting the field. And what got me out of that actually was. Uh, to uh, was actually uh, when when Berger Wernerfeld came and gave a talk at Emory. I don't know if you were there at the time. Um, he Berger Wernerfeld came and gave a talk at Emory in the marketing group because uh, at that point Berger had moved over completely from strategy to marketing. Um, and uh, he gave this you know interesting talk uh, about a paper that was called uh, organizational languages at the time. Um, I think a version of this paper eventually got published in Journal of Business or something like that. Um, but it was, it was interesting. Uh, and he, he presented this mo model. It was an interesting kind of formal model. And it was like, what I found interesting about it was, you know, it was like this um, model of communication within an organization. And, uh, and you could see that if you tweak the assumptions this way, it could, it could tell you something about that. If you tweak the assumptions that way, it could tell you something about something different. And it was a flexible, versatile thing that you could do a lot of things with. Um, and so I thought, gee, I wish I was doing that kind of research. You know, I was envious of, of Berger at that. And, and I thought, I, I really got to. And I decided at that point that if I didn't switch over my kind of research, I was going to quit. I was on you know, because I was I was sick and tired of of doing this this empirical research on on um, 
mutual funds. Uh, yes, it had been it had been published nicely, but my heart wasn't in it, uh, and it wasn't seeing the kind of success I thought it would, especially with this paper that got rejected after four rounds of review. And uh, and so what I did at, was I dropped all my empirical projects. I just dropped them. And I said, I'm going to become a full-time theorist because if I don't, I'm going to quit anyway. Uh, and so that's, that's what happened. I just dropped all my empirical projects and devoted myself to becoming a full-time theorist because Berger inspired me to do that. And, um, uh, and if I hadn't, I, you know, I would be a truck driver, basically. <laughs> so... You know, I, I I want people to sort of grasp the the uh, the ups and downs of a career and, yeah. and uh, the 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 need for transitions and and recovery. Um, but I, I you're sort of trashing some of the earlier empirical work. I know that your empirical work is you did you did obviously make a transition where you decided that you were more interested in puzzles than than um, in in mathematical data. puzzles, if you will, than than in data. Um, but I, I want to point out that one, you know, one of my favorite papers is where you uh, identified firm-specific production functions and and uh, efficiency in in the um, mutual fund industry, where the data really permitted you to to do something unique. Um, and uh, I, I, as I recall, you had to develop your own code because the the statistical software would not allow you to do that. Is that correct? Yeah, I was always having to recode. That's true. <clears throat> yeah, there was not uh, the, the technique hadn't been hadn't been coded at that point into. I remember I was using Arellano bond um, uh, panel data methods before it had been coded into any statistical package. And so I was having to code it myself. Yeah. So I've been going out for a while on, on research and, and um, I want to sort of transition to some other things before we open it up. Um, and by the way, people, uh, if you want to um, add questions in the chat, please do. We'll be uh, opening it up in, in a few minutes. Um, Rich, if, if you can comment on how your research has sort of manifested in, in other parts of your life, uh, you know, how is it reflected in the way you teach? How is it reflected in uh, the, the service assignments that you take on? How is it reflected in, um, uh, oh, I don't know, you have twins. So I, I wondered, you know, how you work with incentives. I wondered how you had, had experimented perhaps with your kids. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Having twins, the, the one piece of advice I'll give if you have twins is to keep a whistle on your keychain. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a whistle on my keychain to get their attention. So, so how would you uh, how would you connect your research life with with these other arenas? So um, you know, it's definitely informed. I mean, the four theories of profit framework has definitely informed how I teach my core strategy course uh, at the um, uh, both at the MBA M MBA level and also uh, at the PhD level. Um, so it's 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 provided kind of an organizing framework for me. Um, and what else? Um, Asim, did you already put the four theories paper in, in the chat? It's, it's not hard to find. There's, there's two of them. There's one in, uh, uh, management science in 2010. Uh, Which you went the 2011 general management one or the general management one is the one in 2011. Okay, put that in there. I wasn't sure which one. So uh, it both of uh, the 2010 is the one that I kind of am most proud of because it, it's it's kind of the first uh, uh, introduction. So this is something you leverage in class. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do, um, and uh, you know, and I'll, I'll say that I think my teaching informs my research as well because I'm often, as a, as a formal modeler, you know, kind of called upon to by you know by reviewers saying. Okay, this is this is a nice theory, but uh, does this really happen? You know, is this really? Can you give us some concrete examples? Give us some anecdotal examples. And so I wind up drawing a lot on my teaching experience for uh, for some anecdotal examples of uh, of, of the kinds of things that uh, that I need to illustrate. Um, you know, I did that recently with this uh, um, first mover advantage versus first mover benefit paper. 
um, where, uh, you know, a teaching example, two teaching examples, actually, one about uh, uh, PepsiCo's acquisition of Carts of Colorado from a case study that I teach in class, and another about uh, the nine-year delay in the entry of the, um, uh, the minivan to the, to the market. Um, those are two kind of concrete examples from, from teaching that I put into, uh, into, um, into research. So what, what I hear you saying is, is uh, what is it, Thorngate's clock face? Uh, the teaching pushes you to, to sort of recognize the, the application end of it, whereas your, your modeling puts you in a solid sort of theoretical domain, but the application isn't obvious until you're sort of forced to, uh, um, to teach it, if you will. Right, yeah. No, so no experiments on your family. No, you know, <laughs> you, you, you do love puzzles or uh, outside of the mathematical puzzles in your in your research. Are there other puzzles that you like to uh, engage in? Yeah, so uh, I will confess that I am powerless over Sudoku puzzles uh, <laughs> and uh, they make my life unmanageable. Uh, I'll spend, you know, hours and hours on Sudoku puzzles. Uh, I've gotten pretty good at it. I've got this Sudoku app on my phone that has, you know, easy, moderate, hard, and challenge. And I, I, I do the challenge ones in about 15 minutes. Um, and uh, I think this is actually relevant for my research because um, one idea I've had for a, for a long time that I haven't done much with is that, um, you know, we, we, we know, a, we, we know, more about the consequences of competitive advantage than we know about the antecedents of competitive advantage. And <clears throat> that's a shame. And I think, um, you know, we have this idea of, of strategic factor markets as being kind of a genesis of competitive advantage. Um, but there is a, there is a strong, rash, basically strategic factor market theory, the way Jay laid it out, is basically the idea that, um, that factor markets are semi-strong efficient in the, in the uh, finance theory terminology, semi-strong efficiency. There is a, a heck of a lot of rationality assumption underlying semi-strong efficiency. And uh, I'm, I, I doubt that that much rationality applies to strategic factor markets the way it would in financial markets. Um, and so I've been toying with the idea of you know, what can we do to loosen up strategic factor market theory to uh, accommodate um, more bounded forms of rationality? Um, and, you know, I think there's a couple of different ways you could go with that. Um, there's some interesting uh, literature in um, behavioral game theory. I don't know if anybody here has followed that. Uh, Colin Kammerer has a nice TED talk about behavioral game theory that I recommend to everybody. It's great, great TED talk. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he talks a little bit about the, the cognitive hierarchy or level K models. The idea is, um, you know, it, there can be limitations on rationality in terms of, I may not fully anticipate what your response to my move will be, right? Uh, and so, so that's a kind of uh, a bound on rationality and that's, that's kind of uh, between the players, right? So, uh, so, I, so this, was, this was my effort to get you off of teaching and I know, I know. off of research and to talk about teaching. But, but what I get from you is you learned from Sudoku um, how bounded one's rationality can well, be. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, the, the assumption underlying, the rationality assumption underlying Bayesian updating, right, is, uh, presumes that there's something what we that, that uh, uh, computer scientists call uh, logical omniscience, right? The idea that if I know A and I know B and I know that A and B implies C, then I definitely know C. Well, not necessarily true, right? Because it can take people some time to put two and two together and say that even though I know A and I know B and I know A and B together imply C, I still may not, it still may take me a while to figure out C. So for example, when I'm looking at a Sudoku puzzle, in principle, I, sh I have all the information there on the, on the grid that I need to fill in all 81 of the numbers from the start, right? And so if I was logically omniscient, 
it should take me no time at all to just fill in all 81 numbers, right? And even as good a Sudoku uh, uh, player as I am, I've downloaded uh, what's what people call the hardest Sudoku puzzle in the world. I have spent hours and hours on that puzzle, and I could not put a single number on the grid. So that tells me that I, you know, I'm completely lacking in, in well, maybe not completely lacking, but I'm lacking in, in logical omniscience. I can know the facts, but not be able to uh, know the implications of those facts, right? And to me, I think if you're looking at something like entrepreneurship and how companies uh, can, you know, create competitive advantage, uh, how entrepreneurs can create competitive advantage for in new in by building new companies, I think it's far more plausible that it's something like that that allows them to do it, right? That they're able to put two, two and two together quicker than somebody else can. Than, than it would be through some kind of Bayesian updating process, right? Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling, so I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> so so um, I want to uh, at least touch on both teaching and service um, before I open it up to the, for uh, audience questions for you. Um, so teaching, you've got all these crazy teaching awards. Um, I know what this is gonna be, but what is your one tip for, you know, how we get teaching awards? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, in the classroom, I view myself as being in the edutainment business. Uh, so uh, I try to keep students in, as engaged as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, I learned from, I don't know, Russ, did you ever do Harvey Brightman's master teacher program? I did. At Georgia State? Yeah, I learned so much from Harvey about... Um, how to, how to engage students, um, you know, his idea of, of, of building in a hook. In, and, in, in, as, in as few words as possible, describe the first five minutes of class at the start of a semester. Yeah, okay, okay, good, thank you, right? So here's what I do at the beginning of the semester in, in teaching my uh, core strategy course. I say, uh, you know, welcome to, this is strategy, uh, in this course, we look at the, you know, the big picture questions. Uh, you know, most, most courses in the business school curriculum focus on ind individual pieces of a business, functional areas like marketing, finance, accounting, operations, information systems. Strategy is the one course where we take a big picture view and look at the performance of the organization as a whole, right? And I say, um, you know, uh, you, you may not know today uh, what drives overall organization performance, but I'm gonna do a little exercise to show you that you at least know a little bit about that, right? And so then I take a $20 bill out of my wallet and I stand there in the front of the classroom and I say, who here would like this $20 bill, right? And some hands go up, right? And I say, who here would like this $20 bill? And more hands go up. And then I say, who here would like this $20 bill? And then at this point, somebody starts, a few people start saying, I'll have it, I want it, I want it. And at this point, I start wa wagging the $20 bill around like this. And I say, who here wants this $20 bill? And at some point, eventually, some student will stand up and come down and grab the $20 bill from my hand, right? And I say, congratulations to our winner, you know, the next Bill Gates or, 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 uh, or Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, you know, thanks for, for playing the game. Um, and I posed the question to the class, why did this one person get the $20 bill while all the rest of you got nothing, right? And that's really the core question in strategy. Why do some firms uh, perform better than others? Why do some of them get the $20 bill and the rest of them get nothing, right? And we use that discussion as kind of a launch pad for understanding uh, the, the key issues in strategy. Right, so we come up with all kinds of ideas about why this one person, I tell them to think outside the box, think as creatively as they can about why this one person got the $20 bill while the rest of them got nothing. And we put all those ideas on the board and I organize them into a framework. And, um, uh, and they, you know, they, they find that, uh, um, you know, a useful way to kind of get started to understanding what strategy is all about. Hmm. So I, that wasn't the one I was looking for. Do you? Oh, do really? You do you still introduce 
your class, you have them take away their name tags and and uh, I haven't done that in a while. Uh, okay. That in a while. So Rich, yeah. just for the for the audience, Rich used to memorize every single student's name, picture, and something about their career. And in, Before in the first class. minute of class, he would have them put down their name tags and introduce each student with their name, something about them. Uh, and you just, you'd, you'd get them all. And this is why I, I know that that's not something that I could have See, done. I, I, used to have, I used to have more time on my hands before I had doctoral students. I, 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 I feel better no, I knowing that you can't do that any longer. Um, uh, I, I do feel like I need to mention uh, uh, service and at least get into ACAC for just a second. Oh, sure. For 12 years, you, you, you introduced this conference. Um, I happen to know that, that con attending other conferences is not always your favorite activity in the world. Um, and yet you created this and it was a very lively conference for a lot of years. Uh, what drew you to, to uh, create ACAC? Yeah, so um, the idea for ACAC came to me uh, when uh, actually I was giving a talk at Ohio State uh, and um, uh, I was talking to some of the people there and, you know, it occurred to me that, you know, the field of strategy is very balkanized, you know, that, that there's different kind of cliques in different places, right? There's, you know, there's the, uh, uh, the kind of the transaction cost click that was, you know, centered at Berkeley. Uh, there was the, um, uh, the competitive dynamics click that was centered at Maryland. Um, uh, there was a, more of a, um, uh, an industry analysis kind of click that was centered at Harvard. Um, there was the, you know, kind of the population ecology click, right? And, um, and, and so there were all these kind of, you know, uh, communities out there that were, that were working more or less independently from each other. And uh, I was really, frankly, envious that the, the because the the uh, in my perception the, the the group that I was part of in the resource based view was not being as effective as some of these other groups, right? They were not not being as effective at getting things published and uh, and uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and you know, because because I thought, well, all these population ecologists they read each other's papers, they know each other, they're helping each other, right? Uh, and, and we don't have that. We didn't really have a community of resource-based scholars anywhere. Um, and so I thought, well, what we need is kind of a, a, a gathering place. We need a, a conference for people who do work on RBD to come together uh, once a year and uh, at least and, and, uh, and share their views um, and, uh, and kind of begin to start to form a community. Um, so that's what that's what motivated me. Plus, in addition, you know, there is there are some things I didn't like about some conferences. You know, academy management is just it's Grand Central Station. You know, you get like six minutes to present a fifty-page paper. You Careful, know? our sponsor is STR. I know, I know. But, you know <laughs> I, I hear you, but they, I'm sure everybody here recognizes the limitation. I mean, look. In, in, fairness, in fairness, back in that day, BPS was not making the effort to create community that uh, the STR is now. So thank That's you true. to our STR leaders for, for doing what was not happening back then. I think, you know, in, in, what, what Academy does well is, is bringing together a broad set of people, right? Um, and what... I, and I'll, I'll, I'll also, I'll also, you know, I'll, I'll be equal opportunity in my, in my insults, right? Uh, SMS at the time, I thought was doing a particularly bad job. Uh, now, folks like you have turned that conference around and done a great job. Uh, but SMS, uh, you know, was expensive, uh, was, uh, you know, the, the intellectual uh, quality wasn't as good uh, and, um, you know, I think it was because they were trying to uh, serve both an academic and a practitioner audience at once, right? And as they say, if you chase two rabbits, both will escape, 
And I think that was the problem that SMS was facing. Now, I think they, they, they've done a lot of things to turn that around now. Um, but, you know, the way you catch the rabbits is if they're leashed to each other, right? If there's a leash going around the neck of both rabbits, then you can catch them by grabbing the leash. And I think that's what Academy does, right? It, with SMS, the two rabbits are unleashed, right? They, they, they can go in any kind of different direction. With Academy, at least, there's dozens of rabbits, right? But they're all leashed together. And so that's where I think Academy gets some synergy. And I think that's a general lesson in, in corporate strategy as well, right? It, that now I you, can't shake this this image of a bunch of rabbits with collars and leashes <laughs> running around. Uh, if I mean, the rabbits are unleashed, then you can ch then you chase them all you want. You'll you'll miss both of them, right? This is a basic lesson of corporate strategy, right? If the rabbits are leashed together through something we call synergy, then you can catch them both. So we've hit that time. In oh. fact, we're beyond that time uh, that we need to um, take a group photo. So. For, uh, for all of you who, have, who are uh, dressed, et cetera, uh, if you can turn on your cameras so that uh, we can see at least most of you, uh, we'll take a little group photo and then we'll, uh, we'll go to some, some of your questions. Good, because I've, 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 I've embarrassed myself enough insulting every conference. <laughs> I'm the photographer here. So um, I'm perfecting my screenshot, uh, sc uh, screenshot photography skills. So. Uh, when I say uh, smile, <laughs> please smile. So one, two, three, smile. Okay, now because you're so many, I have to take two because I could not visualize everybody. So we do it again. <laughs> one, the other two, half of you three, smile. <laughs> smile. <laughs> Thank you. You look great, all of you, all 73 of you. Thank you, Paolo. Okay, so we'll, we'll go to uh, your, uh, your questions. Um, they're sort of dispersed because people were commenting on what Rich was saying. Um, <laughs> there were, uh, there were at least three questions though that I'm gonna, I'm gonna group them together uh, so that uh, you know you can respond to them. I know how strongly you feel about um, mentoring and training PhD students. And there were at least three questions that were, um, you know, if you were to do something different, if you were to, uh, you know, what is your key advice for PhD students? Um, talk a little bit about that. Okay, so, you know, I always ask this question on my YouTube channel to, to people. You know, what's your most important piece of advice for doctoral students? Um, I want to give something, so, so, you know, so I've heard a lot of answers to that question. I, I want to give you something that's different than what, what anybody has, I think, said on, on my channel. Um, I, I believe in the importance of making a contribution to theory. Uh, I think that's my main piece of advice to doctoral students is make a contribution to theory. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the best known people in this field, right? The, the giants, the founders of the field, people like Porter and Barney and Rumelt and Williamson, you know, what made them, they did empirical work, right? Don't get me wrong, they did good empirical work, but that's not what got them famous. What got them famous was their contribution to the world of ideas. Um, that's, what, that's what made a difference. For them. So make a, make a contribution to theory. I like to think of theory uh, to, made, to use a, a military metaphor, um, you know, uh, military doctrine says you want to. We're not going to do the North Korea thing again, are we? No, no, no. We're, we're going <laughs> to. Mil military doctrine says you always want to to grab and hold the high ground, right? Why do you want to grab and hold the high ground? Well, for a couple reasons. First of all, it's easier to defend, right? Because while you know the attackers are coming uphill laboring from going uphill with carrying their, their, you know, their sword and their shield and their armor or whatever they're carrying, all you have to do is roll boulders down the hill at them, right? Uh, and, and you're good, right? The other thing is, if I'm down there in the valley on the battlefield, I can only see and target the people who are right in front of me, right around me, right? From the, from the hilltop, 
I can see and target the whole battlefield, right? I can, and so I like to think of, of theory as being the high ground of, of, uh, of an academic discipline because you can, you know, you can see and target anywhere from there. Thank you. Uh, hey, uh, Manisha, you've made a few comments and I, I think he answered your first question, but maybe not your second. You wanna chime in? Yeah, so basically I just asked about um, PhDs primarily face this imposter syndrome and everybody tweets about it a lot. So do you have any mantras or any kind of blinders or affirmations that you use to overcome um, failures that prevent you from giving up? Um, if there were, if, if there's a cure for imposter syndrome, I'd like to know it because I, <laughs> okay. uh, I don't really, I don't really have a, a solution to that one. Okay. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> we, we are all imposters apparently. Uh, Debraj, you have a teaching question. Yeah. So if I can ask, uh, so uh, I teach a lot of the MBA students, and uh, so how do we, you know, um, make it uh, understandable students about the journal articles, you know, classic articles from, uh, you know, academic journals because they're used to the HBRs and you know more academic. Uh, so how do we make it understandable to them? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, and when Russ asked me the question of how do I apply my research in 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 teaching. I should have actually said, you know what, Russ, I actually apply more of your research and teaching than I do of my own, right? Because uh, when, I, when I teach the core strategy class, um, often I have a section in the course on uh, building competitive advantage from human resource, human assets, right? And of course, I, I actually assign the students to read Russ's AMR paper on, it was AMR, I think, right? Yeah, AMR paper on that topic. Um, and uh, they do find that challenging. Um, but I found it challenging too. <laughs> it's a great paper, man. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I, I just, I guess I think I have to kind of, um, I ask them to read it, but then I spend some time in class lecturing on it and talking about what makes it, um, I, I do two things. One is, um, so I have a video that I show them. Uh, I ask them to view actually offline because it's a 90 minute video. Uh, it's a video about um, the human resources practices at Outback Steakhouse. And um, it basically, uh, if you're paying attention, it illustrates all of the points in Russ's article. Uh, and so I use that as a backbone uh, when I go through and present this to students. I ask them to read the paper and I ask them to view that video and I ask them to think about the connections, how that paper applies to that video. And then I'll go through, you know, I put up Russ's um, figure, uh, the, the complicated figure of uh, uh, the uh, coping mechanisms and the things that lead up to the coping mechanisms. And um, I, I basically go through and say, okay, where do we see this in the Outback Steakhouse video? Where do we see this? Where do we see this? Where do we see this? And, um, and that I think makes it makes it concrete for for the students is to have that concrete example and go through the you know the 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 article and see how does it apply in that particular case. Wow, I didn't expect to learn how to present my research in in teaching, and honestly, <laughs> you spend more time on my research in in teaching than <laughs> I do. <laughs> so I really you could learn. Video, don't you? Here. You have the the Outback Steakhouse video. <clears throat> no, I know the video. I just uh, yeah. Um, I, I just haven't gone that route. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm looking back for other questions um, and uh, we, I've hit on some, but I, I don't think I've hit on all. Uh, anybody have a question that you wanna insert in here? Otherwise I will uh, continue asking questions. Okay, Manisha, you have another one? Uh, no, this was a question from someone else. I just copy pasted it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, from a theoretical perspective, how do you see causality versus correlation or association to justify theory? Hmm. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, I, that's a, so in some philosophical sense, what is causality? What, what is, what do we mean by cause? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not even sure physicists know what causality is. So, so, uh, you know, it's normally we think of that as an empirical question, right? Yeah. Um, because we deal so much in the world of endogeneity, but you're modeling. So why don't you talk a little bit about uh, correlation versus causation in, in a modeling world? Yeah, I think, um, I don't really, I don't really think too much about that. I mean, I think one of the benefits of, 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 um, uh, of uh, doing modeling is that we can kind of cleanly distinguish causality from correlation, right? Uh, that we can we can focus in on the causality and not be distracted by the co the correlations that may be spurious. Um, now, maybe that's not true so much in, in the case of simulations, but with with uh, formal analytical models, it is. I think. Um, you know, I think we're always. Uh, I mean, the, the gold standard for causality, I guess, is the controlled experiment, right? If I can, if I can control everything and assign, um, you know, treatments and control groups and all that sort of thing, then, and, and do manipulation checks, then, then I can say something more confidently about causality. Um, but I, I don't really get involved in that. Uh, except for you know for certain natural experiments that I get that I, uh, I do some research on. So uh, one one of my own here. You you have uh, become an institution builder. The, there was certainly ACAC, but uh, as you move to Purdue, you've you've really uh, tried to create some um, some energy uh, around strategy. If you can describe a little bit about uh, what you have done there. And, uh, and maybe a little bit about what makes a good department versus a not so good department and what can people do about it? Because I think maybe sometimes people feel like they're powerless. Yeah, so that's a good question, right? So one of the things that attracted me to come to Purdue in the first place um, was its legacy in the history of the strategy field, right? There's, I think there's four key legacies that this place has in the history of the strategy field, right? Because strategy as a field of teaching began at Harvard in 1913 with the introduction of the business policy course. But as a field of research, it really began right here at Purdue in the mid 1970s, uh, when basically four things happened. One was that the, um, the first large sample um, quantitative empirical research, scientific research on strategy happened here. Um, prior to that, uh, the most research on strategy was really case studies. Um, and uh, here in the 1970s, uh, uh, Dan Schendel and Arnie Cooper and Ken Hatton uh, did their research on the, on the beer industry, the brewery studies, uh, which was a large sample quantitative research where they looked and they said, oh, look at this breweries differ in their performance and it seems to have something to do with their strategy, right? Uh, and that was really the beginning of, uh, of strategy as a, as a kind of a scientific field of research. So that happened here. And then the second thing that happened was uh, the, the PhD program in strategy. Purdue has uh, had, you know, it was the, the very first independent PhD program in strategy anywhere. Uh, that was separate from economics, separate from organizational behavior, separate from marketing. It was its own independent PhD program in strategic management, and that had not been done anywhere. So it is the oldest independent PhD program in strategy anywhere. Um, then, of course, the third and fourth things that happened here were the founding of SMJ and the founding of SMS. So I think for those four reasons, Purdue has the strongest claim to be the birthplace of strategy as a field of research. And that really attracted me here. So um, one thing that I found when I got here was that uh, the, um, the group did not really have much of a, um, 
uh, much of a cohesive life as a group. Um, and that's, I think, in part because, so Russ, you remember at Emory, we had all the, all the offices were arranged by area, right? All the marketing people had the offices on the same hallway. All the finance people had a hallway. The accounting people had mark offices on a hallway. Our O&M group had, uh, everybody had offices on the same hallway. So there was just that natural you know, bumping into people in the hallway. Hey, let me tell you about a research project I'm working on. I could use your help with this. Hey, you want to go grab lunch and talk research? So there was all that kind of natural hallway conversation that happened. Well, when I got here to Purdue, I discovered that here the offices are assigned on a strict seniority basis, which means that uh, our group was scattered over multiple floors of three different buildings. Uh, and so there was none of that natural hallway interaction and, uh, uh, and you know, discussion of research. And uh, so what I did was I created this, uh, this institution we call the Pro Seminar, which was every Friday morning, we'd get together for 60 or 90 minutes to do nothing but talk about research and uh, professional development activities. We had a rule that no teaching was going to be discussed there because if you let teaching in the door, you know, it's like the camel getting its nose into the tent. It'll take over. Uh, and uh, so we did purely a lot of, a lot of animal analogies here. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, we did purely, you know, research discussions like, you know, people, it was a place that people could come and say, hey, I've got a problem on this project. Anybody have any ideas to help? Or, hey, I've got this data. I don't know what to do with it. Or, hey, I've got a theory, but I don't know what data to test it on. Uh, and so it could become kind of a marketplace for exchange of ideas in that way. And then uh, we also did professional development activities. So for example, I gathered together a, a library of, I'd say about 40 different books on various aspects of the academic career. So there would be like books on uh, how to be a PhD student, how to do a dissertation, how to handle the rookie job market, uh, how to manage the transition from doctoral student to professor, how to mentor doctoral students, et cetera. All these books on all these different topics uh, and so uh, we actually spent uh, a semester doing book reports where uh, we had, uh, we dealt, dealt these books out to the various people in the group. And by the way, this pro seminar was for the entire group, not just faculty, but the doctoral students as well. We'd get the doctoral students and the faculty together for this hour and a half each week. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was, that I think had a big impact on the culture of the group in terms of uh, creating more of a cohesive uh, bond and, and interaction within the group. And we've continued that even with the pandemic, we continue to have the pro seminar online. So that's very cool, by the way. Uh, uh, great, great ideas. Um, I can hear, I hope I hear the, the wheels turning in the senior people who are on this, this uh, meeting here thinking, Oh, I could have an impact at my school. My my department could be better, and this is what I could do. I hope I hope those sure. wheels are turning. Um, what would you say to the more junior people that feel like um, they can't get everybody to come to a pro seminar if they try and create it? Um, you know, if you create it, would they come? Um, if it's if it's good. Yeah, I mean, I think you can start off with the people that you can get to come, right? Your your immediate colleagues, your peers. Uh, uh, oh, here's here's one thing I did that helped. Uh, I I brought uh, cookies. <laughs> so that that definitely helped. Um, so we often don't forget our doctoral student days, and we're still food motivated. Yes, exactly, exactly. So I would bring these cookies and these snack bars and stuff like that. Uh, I think I uh, maybe even brought donuts a couple of times. Anyway, so that was uh, uh, that that I think helped get the pro seminar off the ground. Um, so yeah, and uh, you know, and and okay, so if you have to do a virtual pro seminar, do a virtual pro seminar. Connect with people at other universities and have a, a virtual pro seminar. Right, uh, put together your invisible college. Uh, you could do that. I mean, one thing that I did also in this uh, first couple of years that I came here was I tried to uh, establish a um, kind of a, uh, not so much a joint seminar series, but at least a, um, uh, an alliance between our seminar series and the Illinois seminar series. They're about an hour and a half drive from here. 
uh, and uh, with the idea that you know we would try to avoid scheduling the same people to come uh, in the same semester, and we could go to each other's conferences, uh, each other's seminars by you know, by driving there, and um, you know, and I actually rented a bus using money from my uh, from my chair. It was a nice bus. It had uh, had Wi-Fi on it, and uh, you know, uh, anyway, so. So we would go there to, to Illinois and that worked for a while, um, but um, it turned out that, that even though we were fairly close geographically, we are in a different time zone. And that made it difficult for the Illinois people to come to us because we were an hour earlier than they were. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, they're an, they're an hour earlier than we are. Um, so that didn't, that didn't last beyond maybe two years. Um, but, but, you know, try things out, you know, you can try out an initiative like this, you know, and, like if you want to do a, a book study uh, on different aspects of the academic career, I'd be happy to send you my list of, you know, the 40 books that I, that I got. Uh, and, you know, you could pass those out to your colleagues and say, hey, let's do some book reports and get together and see what I did was I said, um, read this book and come back to us with the two or three most important lessons you learned from that book and just report it out to the group. Um, and uh, I still remember fondly the the uh, time at Emory when we had Carl Weick visit, and we, yeah. we all were in the seminar and we read the book about the the uh, the fire and and uh, you know moment by moment what happened and and analyzing it. it it was one of the the that was fun it was it was incredible actually it was really incredible. Um, so I I, uh, I can see that that more than one of your PhD students um, is is in this meeting and I wonder if any of them want to get back at you. Oh uh, yes, of course. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, I, I see Jay's up, up here, but you know, <laughs> any Jay's or anybody else, uh, you know, want to comment on uh, your experience with Rich? I see Jing is cracking up there. <laughs> oh, I, I got like grapes instead of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think um, when Rich uh, was teaching, I really kind of like knew how he cared about the students, even they are kind of undergraduates, they, they didn't know anything about strategy or they didn't show the interest in learning <laughs> strategy, but he, he always takes care of all of them. Yeah, I can see that um, when being the teaching assistant for Rich. Yeah. Well, I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you jing uh so we have a, a question from paulo paulo you want to chime in hi rich thank you very much for a great great talk today it was really fantastic so i just got um you know sort of you know looking to the future type of question you know with, with your role at amr and, you know, if you had to bet on what will be the big conversation in AMR in the, in, for strategy scholars in the years to come, what would you bet on? Hmm. Um, obviously, there's a lot of energy right now around um, uh, platform business models. Uh, so I expect that'll continue for a little while, at least, uh, until we get bored with that. Um, I actually, you know, I really think that, that we don't know nearly enough about where competitive advantage comes from, the antecedents of competitive advantage. Uh, and uh, I'd like to think that that will be explored more, you know. I think that, uh, you know, various ways of loosening up the... Um, the, the rationality assumptions underlying strategic factor market theory could help there. Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, as I was saying, the, you know, applying some of these ideas about the, the impossibility of logical omniscience or implying, applying some of the ideas from behavioral game theory or just applying ideas about uh, cognitive biases, right? I mean, I, I, if you look at cognitive biases, if you look up cognitive biases on Wikipedia, you'll see a list of over a hundred cognitive biases that have been discussed out there. Those are a hundred different ways that rationality can be undermined, right? So, you know, I think that there's, there's interesting stuff to be done in terms of seeing, okay, well, 
under these different cognitive biases, how would that affect strategic factor markets? How would that affect uh, the ability of, uh, of people to find um, bargains in the factor market, right? Because the rest of the market, because their biases is overlooking this, this, but if I lack this bias, if I can overcome this bias myself, then I can find the bargain, right? So I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work that can be done there in terms of understanding where, where competitive advantage comes from uh, uh, on the factor markets. But I don't know. Uh, th that's just something that interests me. I don't know if that's going to interest the world, uh, but it is something that interests me. Thank you. So Rich, uh, Sina has a, a question for you. She wants you to answer one of your own questions. Sina, you want to chime in? I, I know Sina is not a she. So Sina, how are you doing? <laughs> Hi, Rich. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, so, uh, so one of the recurring questions on your YouTube channel is, how do you go from a, an, an idea and make it a research question? So for doctoral, quest, uh, doctoral students, it's more of a you know, dissertation, uh, uh, the question for dissertation chapters, but uh, I want to selfishly make it mm. in, uh, for, for junior faculty as well, so a research question. Now, having you in the, in the hot seat, I'm wondering what oh. your answer is to that question. Yeah, I knew I would eventually get caught in my own trap, huh? Uh, so let me think about that. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I think um, I, yeah, I don't really know what I do there. What do I do, Russ? I, I think you know you and I came up with that idea for our paper over over burritos at Willie's that day. Uh, you know, you were talking about uh, how um, you know the transaction cost literature really hadn't reckoned with. Uh, with uh, organizational forms that you know differed very much from standard market and hierarchy, and uh, we got to talking about that, and I thought, oh, well, I think I know a way to fix that. Um, I don't know. I just uh, my mind just kind of makes connections between things. I I'm kind of always looking for ways to recombine uh, existing because I think all creativity. There's a video on YouTube. I think it's called Everything Is a Mashup. Uh, and it's a great video. It shows that basically there's nothing new under the sun, but the creative things come from recombining existing things in new ways that people never thought of recombining. So I'm just kind of always on the lookout for, for things that could be recombined. Um, you know, so for example, Russ's uh, insight about uh, uh, there not being much research on anything that differs much from, from, uh, from, market and hierarchy, despite there being a lot of that going on in the real world. Uh, I, I just kind of leaped from that to a connection that I thought saw in my mind to this paper by Holmstrom Milgram uh, in 1994 that I thought, oh, well, you could probably tweak that model to make that work. Um, so I don't know, I'm just kind of- I think of it was the burritos ready. that made that one possible. Yeah, the burritos, definitely. Uh, or the salsa, they had that special salsa there. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm just always on the lookout for ways to connect seemingly disconnected ideas. Uh, and that's, I think, where I get my ideas from. I, I, don't, I don't think I've really answered your question, but it's... Uh, I think I you've think discovered it's a tougher question than you thought and you were subjecting yes. everybody else to it. <laughs> So uh, we're, we're towards the end here. Um, I, I, uh, I have one final question for you, um, which you is- Put, me on, uh, put what, me on the spot to insult somebody else yet. Uh, possibly. Okay. Um, what, what is uh, next for you in Macadoc world? Oh, goodness. Um, well, these days, um, you know, my, my agenda is driven largely by my doctoral students. You know, they, they, they see topics that they want to study and I just, you know, come in to help them study it as, as best they can. Um, so, you know, Jay's is on here and Jay's and I have two papers. Hi, Jay's, wake up. Yeah, uh, we, have, we have two papers on, uh, on strategic human capital, um, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, 
I kind of handle the theory end of that paper, those papers and he handles the empirical end of the papers and somehow we're able to put it together. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I've, I've got um, 10 different research projects I'm working on all at once now. Uh, and I, you know, I could, I could walk you through all of them, but I think I've, I've talked about some of the ones that I find most interesting already. Um, and, uh, 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 yeah, so uh, basically I, I don't really have an agenda at this point. I mean, I'd like, I would like the, the one thing that I would like to do is really finish up the four theories of profit, right? So, uh, I, I'm working on one project, uh, with Nettie. I see Nettie's on the line here. Uh, where we're trying to finally get all four of the theories into a single model, which is really, really hard. Um, and uh, uh, we're getting close. Uh, so th th thumbs up to you too, Nettie, yes. So, uh, so uh, that, I really do have an ambition to get that thing done and maybe write a book about the four theories of profit. Um, but uh, other than that, that's my only kind of self driven ambition and uh, well, and like I said, the thing about the cognitive biases and strategic factor markets, that's something I'm pursuing with uh, EPEC, who I see EPEC is on the line here too, hi EPEC. Uh, and uh, um, uh, other than that, I'm just kind of driven by whatever, whatever, wh whichever direction my doctoral students wanna take me. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, Thank you all of you for participating. Thank you to the uh, STR leadership for making this happen. This is a really cool thing, I, I think, to, uh, to engage the community, which is uh, uh, a, a huge step forward, I think, for probably for, for all of us. Thank you, Rich, for subjecting yourself to, to this. I appreciate, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure you totally knew what you were getting into, but maybe you did, who knows? You, you uh, <laughs> Uh, you, certainly bounded rationality wouldn't present, prevent you from knowing that. Uh, <laughs> At least and, we uh, Dilbert cartoons. And yeah, no, no Dilbert cartoons. <laughs> and thank you to, uh, to Gwen and Paolo and yes. uh, uh, Joe and others who have, have uh, yes. helped us to uh, work out all the details. Yes, thanks very much to Gwen, Zhao, uh, Asim, uh, um, Tim, uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, the whole team at STR uh, really appreciate the opportunity. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today with everybody. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Russ. Round of applause. Thank you so much. And as Paolo has posted in the chat room, we do have another event coming up on the 27th, that's this Wednesday, and a friendly reminder about AOM reviews due Friday, February the 5th. And Paolo also posted the entire calendar, so stay in tuned. That's all. <laughs>